Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Vanal Yanni, Chaudhary English Department. So we shall now begin our three days uh, national webinar series on gender and culture. Uh, it gives me immense pleasure to extend to you a very warm welcome on behalf of the Department of English and Women's Cell of Gaffan Sethi College. We feel extremely lucky and privileged to be hosting an event that presents significant and uh, distinguished personalities who will be uh, sharing their insights, experience, and uh, research on uh, various topics related to uh, gender and culture. And tonight, uh, we would also uh, like to invite our participants to be active contributors of questions or opinions. And you may uh, send your, you may post your questions directly in the chat box or send them personally to the host. And without wasting our time, it's already seven. Without wasting our time further, we will now uh, invite our speaker for tonight, Dr. Christina Zedzama. And uh, words have passed around that her students fondly refer to her as a cultural scientist, uh, the seeker and a devil's advocate. And I'm sure we will, uh, Oh, uh, we are all anticipating to listen to her speak on LGBT and the uh, MISO. So Dr. Christina, if you're ready. Yes, thank you, uh, Ivan Lalyani. Um, I hope I'm audible, can you see me? Yes, yes. Yes. Yes, we can see you. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. So, um, without much ado, even I will, uh, I guess, get into the whole act itself. I know that uh, the uh, government Sertip College, uh, when you uh, approached me regarding this particular webinar that you were organizing, I was requested and told that, uh, you know, the subject could be as wide as possible. And it had to be around, you know, issues of gender and culture. Um, so I thought, like, what approach do I actually use? So um, I know that, um, you know, I could use a very specific, you know, literary approach. Um, be very theoretical in my approach to actually talking about LGBT, um, especially in the MISO context, because it is an area which is thoroughly understudied and it is also thoroughly censored, like we all know. So um, <clears throat> I am using an interdisciplinary approach to give my talk tonight. And uh, I know I was told, you know, you have around 30 to 40 minutes. So I will be talking slowly. My paper is not long I will be talking slowly and I hope that later on after I finish my uh, talk could have done more but I was also not trained to all right so in that sense um, after her death all right many many years later I actually met her father in in the airport Right. I met her father in the airport. He did not remember me. So I, I approached him and I told him, sir, do you remember me? Uh, I was a teacher to Muzi Velu, your, your daughter. And uh, Appa Khan, when he saw me and when I introduced myself and when, when I mentioned the name of his daughter, the fact that I knew I knew her and her problems, Appa Khan, his, his response was he actually started to cry. He started to cry there in, in, the, in that public space in the airport. And I could tell that he was a torment. And it was very, very tragic because I am sure he didn't talk about it. I am sure he was traumatized by that experience himself. He must have felt some kind of a guilt himself. And, you know, we can make our own conclusions as to the kind of cultural and social pressures and, and other kinds of pressures that he must have actually experienced. So that it is from that point of view that we have to also understand the kind of difficulties and pressures that we, as a culture, we put on parents 
on parents and who have to raise uh, children who are the society lacks avenues for dialogue and for providers to help this crucial combination of pair relationship on how to cope with even the mildest degree of homophobia, of teasing, and of verbal abuse. Many parents refuse to engage with the reality of having to raise a gay son or daughter because silence means the hope for the hope that the problem will actually go away. It is heartening though that there are many parents also, there are many, many parents conversations with, who accept and totally support their children, all right, their child, although it is a given that they feel that they cannot do much about the way society treats their children. So aside from the existence of homophobia and prejudice, we know that a sizable population are empathetic to the queer community and real problems that plague them. So it is actually a um, a misconception that everybody hates the idea of the queer community or that somebody else has a different orientation from me. So not everybody is, is um, as close-minded, right? Church parents and civil society have recognized and acknowledged for a long time the need to talk about the elephant in the room. The intimate and labyrinthine relationship between doctrine, culture, and sexual orientation has always been addressed only from a theological point of view, from a moral point of view, and from an ethical point of view, and never in a more practical point of view. This fixation is moral and immoral. We should acknowledge that, yes, there is this fixation on it. Yes, there must be some truth to it, but we need to just look at it and then we need to set it aside because this so-called LGBT issue, and, I, and I'm putting this word issue in inverted commas, all right? This so-called LGBT issue has not been solved with years of non-inclusive discussion. The discussions have always kind of put the LGBT community outside. And so it hasn't really arrived at any practical conclusions, right? This is, the dominance of one group while silencing the other and all the while condemning the queer community surely means that we too, from the side of representatives of civil society, need to revise our rigidity and take a long and hard look at how our own inequities, our own prejudices is oppressing and holding up the achievement of a thriving and happy society. Surely, as mature adults, we can look for inclusive ways to meet in the middle without having to argue about who is right, who is going to heaven, and who is going to hell. I'm sure God already has a lot of work on his hands without us having to help him regarding that. We will all end up dead anyway one day but before we actually before we actually die we have to live and thrive as a culture and society so here the the last and hardest question that i want to ask all right uh, is the lgbt community themselves all right so for many of you who may be listening in all right to this conversation let me ask what would it take on your part to live your best life? Will it be political empowerment, social inclusion, freedom of expression? The answers may all be an easy yes to all three, but the detail is in the question, what would it take? To truly liberate oneself from the mental space of victimhood, right? Or come away with the narrative that everybody, we have to come away with the narrative that everybody is persecuting me or that they are out to victimize me. So this kind of a narrative that even the LGBT community tell themselves, you have to be able to come out of that headspace, right? Yes, straight allies, that is actually the term, that it is actually a, a, an official term that is used, all right? Straight allies. It is a term used for straight people who have empathy towards, uh, you know, the queer community and their, their um, condition and their experience and their trauma, all right? So they are known as straight allies, all right? I'm a straight ally and I'm proud to be one, all right? So yes, straight allies are extremely helpful, but at the end of the day, the hard work falls on the queer community themselves. 
in my many interactions with people from the, the queer society, the queer, the queer community, I came to realize that there is a lot of bickering, there is a lot of rivalry between different cliques within the queer community, that a lot of the LGBT themselves are quite ignorant with regards to their own condition, all right? And I'm saying with all the good intentions, because this is also what I have observed. And also I'm going to say that this is a generalization on my part. I'm not saying that everybody is ignorant, all right? I'm not saying that everybody is petty. So here it's a generalization, but not everybody is tone deaf. Many like playing the victim role, unfortunately. So even the LGBT community themselves should ask, all right, why do I play the role of the victim? What do I need to do in order to not take things lying down when somebody is verbally abusing me or when somebody is blatantly being homophobic towards me and hurling abuse towards me, all right? Or they feel like they have a right to grope me or pass very, very mean jokes at my expense. What do I need to do, all right? So some, even within the... LGBT community have done unthinkable things, all right, of outing someone else without their consent. And Kashi at Peyton, I was quite upset to hear this, all right. You know, it, I do not know what the reasons were, but there are some who have actually outed somebody else, all right, without their consent. And some have even resorted to online bullying. Online bullying in and of itself is a whole different hornet's nest, right? But even in the uh, queer community, in the Mizo queer community, they have resorted to these um, ways, all right? Is it attention-seeking behavior? We do not know. But if, I would just like to say that if we want the heteronormative society to actually treat us with respect, we should also accord that equal respect to our own fellow uh, queer community, right? So anyway, I've gone on and on. So it's nearly eight o'clock. Uh, I just would like to say that the queer miso themselves, all right, what do they need to do? What would it take? So what is the roadmap? Me as a straight ally, all right, I would just like to suggest by contributing that the, the, the queer community can come together to find new terms of reference. Now what we have the terms, we have terms like twai, patil, you have just these four words and probably there are more that I may have not have heard of. I would be very, very glad if you can educate me on that. But what I am trying to say is that even for the government, even for policy makers and even for our leaders of society who want to help the community, the terms of reference are very, very narrow. All right, so what the queer community themselves can do is decide on how they would like to be called, how they would like to define themselves, describe themselves, all right? So this is just a suggestion on my part. Queer Mizo should talk about these issues and even probably about mental health, all right? A lot of, the, a lot of people that I do counsel uh, in my office in the university, all right, a lot of them are with regards to uh, mental health issues. I am aware that some effort has been taken by a few individuals from within the queer Mizo community, which is absolutely fantastic. Some of them work as social support group, but I'm sure it is on a very, very limited uh, scale, all right? I really hope that that particular aspect of your community grows. Yes, Rome wasn't built in a day, but nothing gets built in a day. It takes time, but we need to start somewhere. You need to start somewhere. So to actually conclude my, my talk tonight, I would like to bring us back to my opening questions. What are the most optimal conditions in which all groups that exist in society can move forward together as inclusively as possible? What kind of a society do we want to live in? The most optimal would be when we respect difference and find similarities to solve challenges as a collective society where one group doesn't dominate or thwart or censor and silence other smaller minority groups and allow everyone to live their best lives, to, put one, to learn to put oneself in the shoes of a victim, all right, 
and be generous enough to share winnings rather than take away another person's right to their personal happiness. So I'm going to draw your attention to six key variables that have been used to measure happiness in the World Happiness Index, all right? There is this index that the United Nations actually does conduct every year, all right? And they have used these six variables to measure happiness of a society. Number one, the GDP per capita, obviously economics. Number two is social support. Yes, we Miso, we may pride ourselves in having very, very good NGOs in our society and good social support. I absolutely acknowledge that I am a part of those NGOs, but how much, how democratic and how open and willing are uh, our social support systems, right? Number three is health life expectancy at birth. Number four, freedom to make life choices. Very, very important. Freedom to make life choices. Number five is generosity. And number six is perception of corruption. These reports critically conclude that apart from these six variables, the most important aspect is that of well-being. And in fact, the 2001 theme of the United Nations World Health Report, World Health, sorry, World Happiness Report is happiness for all forever. So that is the theme of the year, happiness for all forever. Let us see how much we are willing to give that, spread that happiness around, isn't it? So I wonder what we would score on this report as a Mizo society. How happy are we? And how can we change for the better? Right? So I rest my case. And thank you. I've come to the end of my talk. Thank you, uh, Dr. Christina, for uh, once again uh, familiarizing and acquainting us to the world of LGBT and area. Most of us dare not enter yet, and we're all extremely quick to pass judgments on. Now, to spice things up from the field of psychology, I would like to invite to see results and more to boost our thinking and and initiate the discussion on the topic already presented by Dr. Christina. Uh, we are truly grateful for his presence tonight and we are looking forward to a lively discussion session under his guidance. I now call upon Dr. C. Zotanmoy to add comments, questions, or uh, share a dialogue with our speakers, uh, whichever way he wants to approach it. Uh, thank you, Ms. Manaliani. Um, first off, I'd like to say that I'm very honored to be here, to be invited by the Department of English, Government, Serchi College, to give my comments on the topic that was presented very eloquently by uh, Ms. Christina. Um, there is a lot to say. I would, I'd like, just like to mention that there is a lot that I could say, but I will try to keep it short. And I am from the social science school and the researches that we do, the information that we get is mostly done through empirical research. So I will be trying to mention some researches that have been, that have been done in Mizoram because that is uh, a contribution that I can make because obviously I cannot comment too much from the literary point of view. So Ms. Christina, I think had asked if there were researches done. Yes, researches have been done in the field of um, homosexual studies and I will also be pointing out or mentioning some data that have been published as well. So she had mentioned that the research she talked about that she had mentioned was done in 2010. So that was more than 10 years ago. I have a much more recent research that was done, which was actually done only last year in 2020 by 
a student from the Department of uh, Social Work in Missouri University. And he had talked to a hundred homosexual men from Mizoram. Sorry, not Mizoram, all right. So it was much narrower from ISOL. And so what he found out, uh, basically I think um, echoes what the previous researchers have also found out that um, homosexuals in ISOL, I won't say Mizoram because the research was done in ISOL. I can't speak for the rest of the state as, as yet. So in ISOL, um, most of these uh, people who were interviewed, who answered the questionnaires, they do report being um, discriminated against. So I think we all know that that is quite expected. Um, at the same time, some interesting things that was also found out from this research was that um, the support that homosexual men get, of course, more than half of them, 52%, received it from their fellow um, or gay men. But interestingly, it was found that 20% 20, 20 of them received support, their secondary support from uh, their straight male friends, while 10% said they received their primary secondary support from their female friends. So I think that was quite interesting. And um, I think we've come uh, a ways from the homophobia of the yesteryears. And also a very big thing that was mentioned from that was studied in the research was that, um, of course, when we talk about the Mizo culture, we cannot omit the church because it has a big presence in all of us. And for many gay men who were raised in a Mizo society, who were raised in the church in itself, um, they feel very conflicted because they want to belong to the church. They want to be a part of the church. They were raised in the church and they um, want to contribute to the church as well. But at the same time, we know that most of the churches in Mizoram, they, are, uh, they strongly condemn homosexuality. And we know that um, a few years back, even the Presbyterian Church of Mizoram had um, stopped its association with the Presbyterian Church of America because the Presbyterian Church of America had started ordaining um, homosexual um, pastors and elders. So I think that we cannot overlook this as well. And they feel very conflicted. And I think that that is a very sad thing because if you were raised in a certain way, if you were raised in an environment and then you grow up and then you find that you cannot or you are um, being, you are being uh, told that what you are and how you are is wrong, it's a sin. I think that will be very traumatic for many people and it will also be very, very um, um, disheartening for them. But at the same time, we know that the church has its, um, its own doctrines. And we know that um, it takes, it is very difficult for the church to change its doctrines. But at the same time, I think there can be a way that, you know, the two can go along. Because even I personally know men, homosexual men, who are very um, active in the church, they love the church, they are spiritual, they love God, um, but they feel conflicted. So I think that this is a discussion that we need to have more of. We just can't um, put it aside. We just can't ignore it because there has to be a way that these two can go side by side, at least uh, so that people can be a part of the church that they love so much. All right. And uh, secondly, mm, is the issue of language. All right. So I was going through a paper written by my friend. Uh, from Pachon University College, Ms. Mamni. She has also done a lot of research in the uh, LGBT community. I think it's also her a topic of her 
PhD thesis as well. And I looked up one of the references and it was actually mentioned that in the history of Mizoram, in the Mizor history, this is an oral history, that there is actually mention of the son of a Mizo chief who smokes Duibur. We know that Duibur was smoked only by the women and he wears a traditional puan like the female folks. And his voice is also said, was said to be feminine. But during war time, when it was time to go to war, he fought as valiantly as any of the other uh, men in the village. All right, so I think that in our history, we have had uh, an acknowledgement of homosexuality because even the terms Tuai and Patil, they have existed these are Mizo terms. They are not taken from any other language. They're not taken from the English or from the Hindi language. We came up with those two terms on our own, Tuai and Patil. So that is an acknowledgement of the fact that uh, homosexuality had existed, that homosexual men and homosexual women were acknowledged. The extent to how they were acknowledged, I cannot say because I have not done research in that and also because I believe that many of our historical uh, data were unfortunately not recorded on paper. They were only passed on through oral traditions and many, many information would have been lost along the way. But even just the existence of those two words, I believe, tells us that we acknowledge the existence of homosexuality in the Mizo community. At the same time, uh, we are a very patriarchal society and why they were not given um, more acknowledgement has been in my mind for a while. And so I was thinking back to this, the way the Mizo society was back then. I can feel a put hunlaya and khutlan omdan, the structure of the society had kang So what came to my mind was back in those days, we were a very, very warring tribe. All right, so one tribe lived in one village, another tribe lived in another village, and so they would go to war with each other. So it was very, very hard times. And I believe that for the village to be dominant and for them to even exist, to even have a chance of existing, they needed all the available men in the village to be warriors. They needed to be the strongest warrior possible. And they needed the women to produce as many children as possible because back in those days, it was um, it was a very important thing to have the numbers. So I believe that that uh, system that we had and the, the way the community was built, I think that had a very huge effect on how men saw, how the society saw uh, men who were not as masculine as they should be or women who, are, who were not as feminine as they should be. So the gender roles were quite set. And in a way, I think that it was understandable for those times. But now we've come a long way, I believe. And I've often said that the Mizo society, we have jumped so much from an agricultural society to a modern society. We've actually bypassed so many steps along the way. Uh, we've bypassed, um, you know, um, dark ages. We've bypassed uh, you know, any kind of revolution. So we jump from an agricultural society to a modern society. And so I believe that in that stead, I think there can be more of an acceptance of homosexual, homosexuals in the society. And not only because we, don't, we no longer need to be um, warriors, we don't need to fight anymore. Men don't need to be fighters, like physically fighting. Like there are other ways of fighting, obviously, um, but we still need masculine men, obviously. But I think it's, we can now have space where we can have um, people who are not, men who are not ultra masculine or women who are ultra feminine, right? So we can have space for those, I believe. And I think even in today's society, we have had a lot of um, homosexuals who have contributed a lot to society, all right? in say the medical field, the academic field, education, even in business. So they're not just there, all right? They're not just 
uh, eating off or living off other people. They're actually contributing to society. So in that way, maybe we can hopefully move towards a more accepting society, towards a more accepting community. And um, some people call me blindly optimistic and I do think that we are moving in that direction because I look at the newer generation, um, some people would, call, people would call them Generation Z, I think they're much more accepting than the previous generations. But still, we, there is so much work that needs to be done, right? Um, so many of the stereotypes that have existed, uh, which needs to be undone. And even in the minds of um, our mothers, in the minds of our fathers, in the minds of our elder brothers and sisters, uh, maybe they won't change because once uh, human beings reach a certain age, you know, it becomes hard to change our mindset. So maybe with the new generation, we can have a more accepting society, all right? And um, what Ms. Christina had mentioned before, so much mental health issues among um, the LGBT people. Um, and incidentally, this is what leads people to actually uh, use substance, alcohol and drugs to cope with their reality. Of course, uh, there are those people who are doing it just for the heck of doing it. But there are also people who are trying to mask the pain that they feel of not being accepted by their parents, of not being accepted by their siblings or the community. So for them, uh, taking alcohol or doing drugs maybe um, becomes the only way that they can cope with the reality. And if we actually take a deeper look at that, you know, just don't judge someone because he's drinking or she's doing drugs. Like take a deeper look into that person's life. Right, try to take the time to know that person. Maybe that person has had a very, very deep hurt in his or her life, right? So that is also a very important part of uh, psychological counseling as well. We need to get to know the person, you know, get behind everything. Um, and um, so, yeah, um, I think I'll end my, <laughs> my contribution there for now. Um, I think there's, again, a lot to be said, but I think those two points of the psychological effects as well as uh, looking at our history, I think, um, I hope that has added to the contribution, to the discussion as well, so. Mr. Te, I think there's one question. Uh, could you please read out the question? Okay. Uh, here we have question for the speaker. The biggest obstacle towards acceptance of LGBT plus people is our main Christian perspective that states, okay, that states that homosexuality in itself is a sin, whether it is manifested with action or with or even without, do you believe in praying away the gay or is it actually more harmful? Can I, can, can you just repeat the <clears throat> questions again? I'm just writing it down. Okay, I think it's two questions, okay. Yeah. A, the biggest obstacle towards ex ex acceptance of LGBTA, uh, Okay, I don't know what he's writing. Okay, plus people is our people is our Mizo Christian perspective that states that homosexuality in itself is a sin, whether it is manifested with action or even without. Do you believe in praying away the gay, or is it actually more harmful? Yeah. Should I repose? Uh -huh in the chat no no that's up to you i i have no problem okay uh so um if i may answer 
Uh, I think I'll start with the second question first, all right? Um, you know, this bring the gay away concept is, uh, you know, it's there in many, many societies, Christian societies. And uh, if you're going to pray for the gay person, then there should be nothing wrong with it. You're praying for their good health, you're praying for their success, and you're praying for their happiness, then it's all right. But with the in the context of trying to pray that their gender orientation, their gayness actually fades away, then um, they themselves will discover that it is not an effective way to actually deal with the situation, all right? So if people feel that, uh, you know, they want to do that, then it's absolutely up to them. But it should be understood that for the individual, for the gay individual who is at the receiving end, right, that that individual should also be asked whether they want their gay to be, you know, gone, right? Because it is who they are. So there is this saying, um, hate the sin and love the sinner. But for a, a person from the queer um, society, the, the gay person, you cannot really separate the gay and the, and the, and, you know, the, the, sin and the, the sin and the sinner, isn't it? Just like all of us are a combination of saint and sinner, you cannot really expect that of another person. So I do not believe in that approach. All right. The, the question that came along with this bring the gay away is that in our miso uh, Christian community, they talk about the fact that uh, being homo homosexual is a sin. All right. So uh, one thing I just want to uh, talk about here, which is actually a very, very good question that you have asked me. All right. So thank you for that question. You see, when you talk about the Bible and its teachings, I am not a theologian, so I'm not even going to get into what the Bible says and things like that. But um, we have to understand that we live in a society that is a democracy, right? The democracy of our, you know, the constitution of our country actually talks about the right to, you know, certain rights and certain freedoms. And that the fact that we do not live in a theocracy, right? A theocracy is a government, all right? Is a society, is a government, right? Where you have a few people ruling and sometimes just one, like in the case of Ir Iran and all, you have an imam and they rule in the name of God. They rule in the name of certain doctrines of their religion, all right? We have to understand that even us Mizo society, we are not a theocracy, all right? Being, living in a theocracy is actually a very dangerous thing. When you look at the 2021 or 2020, certain, certain uh, countries who are actually theocratic countries, all right, Iran, Sudan, you have all of these very, very heavily Islamic countries. When you look at their countries, they are destroying their own country. They are imploding because of their theocratic approach to government. Why is a theocracy, uh, you know, uh, dangerous? Because um, it stigmatizes critical thinking, all right? The fact that we live in a democratic society means that you and I, all right, are actually able to have this conversation without fearing for our lives, all right, number one. So theocracies actually stigmatize critical thinking, all right? There is no separation between the government and religion, all right? Religion is often used as a pretext, all right, for conflict and oppression. I want to strongly state on this. It is actually a very, very dangerous notion, all right? It promotes ideas of superiority, all right, rather than humility. So in a theocracy, one group will feel very, very self-righteous, all right? Whereas, you know, when we look at our Christian faith, we have to believe, we have to truly, truly believe that our religion also talks about tenets of kindness, of understanding, of love, of brotherhood, and of all of those actually good parts. So if we are going to constantly talk about sin and we're going to talk about what the 10 commandments say, then we can also make the argument that, you know, all of us are actually sinners. And by that fact, you know, then the churches, there would be nobody to go to churches if they only welcome saints, right? Because human beings, we are a combination of saint and sinner. So I think it is a very, very harmful argument to put forth 
that only a certain that a certain section of a society are not welcome in the church all right and the the other question uh, regarding the biggest obstacle to lgbt acceptance i think it is in our miso context i think it is uh, has a lot to do with ignorance it has a lot to do with the stereotypes and how do we overcome ignorance ignorance may, may be bliss but it is you know a very dangerous kind of a bliss right so what do we do regarding that it means you have to come in to contact with these kinds of discourses and these discussions tuna kan thu soye chang ti pohan tam takha kan ril ru hai in hong ve thai ani we realize that certain words that we may use certain actions and certain jokes that we tell are in the expense of some individual All right, that we could be the cause of somebody having insomnia, somebody experiencing mental health issues, somebody being depressed, somebody wanting to commit suicide because of the jokes that we tell on on you know, um, with regards to that particular community. So it's actually a very dangerous thing. So I would say that you know, ignorance and definitely not having any gay friends. Let me tell you, please have. please feel free to have be, uh, friends from the queer community all right they are like everybody else all right and very very fun to be around so i we have to demystify all right we have to try and take apart this whole discussion of sin and morality who is right who is wrong all right and we have to be able to overcome those shortcomings because it will definitely help us be more accepting of people who are not like us right so that would be my question uh, dr moy i'm sure he will have some things to say also all right so you were talking about um teasing and mocking that brings back memories of my own childhood because as a child i was not the most masculine boy i got teased um but i was luckier than most it it did not go beyond the verbal teasing but it really made me you know go back into my own shell you know just stay at home uh, read books play video games and it can actually be very damaging for a child again we're not children but in the future we will be having children so i just want to put it out there that you know uh, teasing someone because of what they are and something that they cannot change i think that is something that is very very uncalled for and that can be very damaging um and another thing that came to my mind was this concept of inbol right means which inbol can change me uh and i don't know if it it was quite rampant while i was growing up i don't know what the younger generation is how much they're into this practice anymore but um you know when there you have a group of girls and then you have um a boy with them you know even sometimes those group that he's hang out with and then bold out you know they would uh, egg him on you know they would he would behave in a certain way and then they would applaud that behavior because they find it amusing right so i think this is also quite damaging and this also gives adds to the stereotype that we have in mizoram in the mizoram society um and not just in the context of uh, homosexuality but even in many many other areas as well all right in the way that we raise kids uh, in the way that we work together as a community maybe even in the yma um this uh, in bolit so it dilavangu right there's a good way of uh praising someone you know a very very genuine heartfelt um praise can be made but adding that tone of sarcasm i think that is what is very damaging to the mizos as a society and um yeah um praying the gay away we don't believe in that that because in psychology we have had a number of approaches to homosexuality we've had the psychoanalytical approach uh, but usually in empirical studies we have more or less uh, debunked most of the psychoanalytic theories though we still study them 
And now we have come to uh, accept mostly the biological approach, even though we can say for sure that there is a gay gene or certain things um, contribute to a person being gay. But hormone studies have been made wherein um, the predominance of a particular hormone in the mother while she's carrying her child could possibly be linked to that child being homosexual. So that would be an excess of testosterone while she's carrying a daughter or an excess of estrogen while she's carrying a son. So it's biological, it can be prayed away, it can be cured, right? And I also believe that, you know, God doesn't make mistakes. So uh, if someone was not to be the way that he or she is, then I don't think God would have made him or her in that way. At the same time, you know, there's that excess that is added through experiences in life. Ms. Christina had mentioned um, an attention-seeking behavior. I think we observe this in some people. So that uh, particular uh, thing is there, but generally from a psychological point of view, we accept the biological basis. And personally, I believe that there can be no mistake. So I think actually trying to pray the gay away, I think it'd be much more harmful actually. So in light of the statement that you have made just now, there's one uh, uh, statement put up for discussion, I think, put up for discussion, yes. The label Boragna moreover is often associated with them, which is also true in most cases. Can you please repeat? And there's another question. The label or over is often associated with them, which is also true in most cases. I'm not sure. I think that I think that is or... just a question. Yeah, it's just a comment. I think. Okay, so there's another question. I think one last question. A question for Miss Christina. Uh, do you think it's time to formally introduce the queer to our Mizo literature? And do you think introducing the queer to our literature will solve or increase the problem faced by the queer? Mm -hmm. You know, I can only uh, speak from what I know. Uh, in the department, in the MDU, um, our English department, we are actually, we have changed our nomenclature now. We are actually called the Department of English and Cultural Studies, all right? And uh, hopefully, um, am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, you are. Hello, am I audible? Yes, yes, okay. Yes, thank you. So um, in our department, we have always encouraged, uh, you know, these kinds of topics. And uh, there are our research scholars who are actually working on, uh, you know, intersexuality and, uh, you know, homophobia and homosexuality and things like that. And we even teach them, we even teach uh, queer literature and things like that, all right? So yes, it actually is already there. And if you are talking about specifically in Mizo literature, why not? Because that would be a very, very good suggestion and a very good um, point of entry to talk about the LGBT issues, not just in literature, but also the conditions that they face. And you know, whether it is going to work positively or negatively, nobody knows because that is out of our control. But I definitely believe that in my own context, I, I believe that it should work positively. So that is my answer. Thank you, Dr. Christina. Um, it seems there are mo no more questions. So maybe I should end the session, tonight's session. And uh, before ending the session, uh, we thank both our speakers tonight for exploring the areas 
much discussed in private, but not so done publicly regarding LGBT and the MISO. And we appreciate your honesty and uprightness on behalf of the Department of English and the Women's Cell Government Statistics College. I would like to express our uh, sincere gratitude to our ex esteemed speaker, Dr. Christina Zedzama, for uh, visiting and enlightening us with her vast knowledge on LGBT and sharing her perspective from the MISO context. And it is undeniable that all of us would have benefited greatly from her talk. And we also extend our deep sense of appreciation to Dr. Cecil Tanmoy for his further analysis and insight on the topic. Thank you, uh, Dr. Christina and Dr. Moya for uh, gracing us and making our first night a success. Lastly, we extend our appreciation to our participants for the positive feedbacks and for active, actively getting uh, involved uh, through your questions. As tonight is only the opening night of our uh, three days national webinar series, we once again invite everyone to stay with us and continue to grace us uh, on the second and uh, third day of our webinar series. Tomorrow's session will start at uh, 3 p.m. in the afternoon. We hope to see everyone again. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.